All right, it's good to be here tonight, uh, Romans uh, class, and we're on chapter number five tonight. This is lesson number five, Romans session number one, and I do want to thank uh, those in uh, Stanford, Nebraska. Uh, I want to thank Elijah and Josh uh, for the faithfulness, uh, helping there in the Bible College, uh, getting the material there together. Also want to thank uh, the, and, and welcome our newest, uh, um, our newest uh, satellite school in uh, Guyana, in uh, South America. We do appreciate uh, Pastor Ram and God, and uh, love him, and uh, just appreciate him and uh, the work there uh, in Guyana. Uh, Romans chapter five tonight, and we're going to begin again in this chapter. And I, I appreciate uh, the lesson we heard tonight in First Corinthians. And I appreciate Brother Tony filling in for us last week. But Romans chapter number 5 continues actually with the theme of justification. Aren't you glad that you're justified this evening? Thank God for justification. When we get saved by the grace of God, uh, we immediately become justified. I like the analogy, just as if I'd never sinned. That's easy to remember. Say that with me. Just as if I'd never sinned. So that's a good way to remember justification. And uh, by the way, uh, it's a good thing to know that you're justified because one day we're going to stand before a thrice holy God. Amen. And boy, I'm glad that I can say that and claim it, not by my own merits, not by my works, but by His grace. Amen. Justification, however, is actually uh, just the beginning of the blessing that God has actually bestowed upon us because now we are justified in His sight. In tonight's lesson, we're going to look at two things, I believe, that happen in the life of the believer upon being saved. First of all, we're going to look at the first point, the immediate outcome of justification. And secondly, we're going to look at the insured outcome of justification. And this will continue uh, verses 1 through 11, and then we'll look at the rest of the chapter. I have two more points to look at after that. But notice the two words in our study tonight that you might want to be familiar with. And I'm going to give you two words. The first word is access, and the second word would be reconciliation. The word access actually simply means this, the privilege of being introduced to God. And boy, what a privilege it is tonight to think that we've been introduced to God. We have access with and unto God. That privilege comes through and only through a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. In Hebrews chapter number 10 and verse number 19 through 22, the Bible says this, having therefore brethren boldness to enter into the holiness by the blood of Jesus. By the way, uh, the Old Testament priest went into the Holy of Holies. He didn't go in alone. He went in once a year at the Day of Atonement into that place and what did he do? He sprinkled the blood of the sacrifice. And by the way, you'll not go into God's throne room, amen, apart from the blood. You and I can't go in. We've got to have the blood. And by the way, uh, they said that they would tie a, a rope around the ankle of the priest in case he messed up, in case that something happened and God struck him dead. Then that way they could drag him out. Oh, I'm thankful tonight that I don't have to worry about messing up because I have the blood of Jesus has been applied. And so we have boldness. And I'm glad we have boldness. Did you know you can access and go right into the presence of God? Isn't that good tonight Amen. to know Amen. that we have troubles and trials in this life? And even at that, Brother Tony, we can go right into the presence of a living God. I don't have to come to Rabbi Tony Malay. Amen. I don't have to come to him and have him to go in uh, as the high priest and, and go in and, and I don't have to call for the ephod. Amen. I don't have to go to a box and talk to a man in a box and say, forgive me, Father, for I have sinned. Amen. I'm glad that I can go right into the presence of a holy God. What a greatness tonight to know that we can go boldly enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. Hebrews 10, 20, by a new and living way which He hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say His flesh, verse 21 of Hebrews 10, and having a high priest over the house of God. Brother Arvel, I want to preach there. Let us draw near 
with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. What a great, great section of Scripture in Hebrews 10. The word, and that's the word access. I'm glad, thank God tonight, I have access to the throne of glory. Yeah. By the way, there'll be a time coming in your life, you might not appreciate that much right now, but there may be a come a time in your life when you'll really appreciate the access that you have unto the throne room of God. Amen. Amen. Boy, there'll be a trouble in our life come. A wind will blow. A storm will come up. All of a sudden, the sea will be raging. Boy, we'll need to call on God, Brother Kent. And the pastor may not be available right then, but I'm thankful, glory to God, even when the pastor's not available, the great high priest is always available. Aren't you? But the word reconciliation, it means to change thoroughly from one position to another. In 2 Corinthians 5, 18 and 19, the Bible says this, And all things are of God who hath reconciled us to Himself by Jesus Christ and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. In verse 19 of 2 Corinthians 2, 5, it says this, To wit, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto Himself, not imputing their trespasses unto Him, and hath committed unto us the word of of reconciliation. When we stand before God, we are clothed in the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ and His atoning blood, and it gives us access to God. And we should shout over that, amen? Uh, the words access and reconciliation are just two wonderful words. Now, I want you to notice with me in verses 1 through 5 of Romans chapter number 5, we're going to look at the immediate outcome uh, of, of our reconciliation. The Bible says this in verse number 1. Notice in your Bible, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Aren't you glad for the peace of God that we have? There, there actually are three things that we can plainly see in verse number 1 concerning making our peace with God. A lot of people will say they've made peace with God. And a lot of people will say, I'm ready, I'm ready, I've, I've made peace with my Maker. But you know what? Uh, just saying that does not mean that they've done it. But there are actually three things here in this verse. First of all, notice the claiming of peace. The Bible says being justified by faith. Salvation is not by the law, but by faith. Works will not bring peace to the soul. Faith, my friends, is the only way to have peace with God. Do you remember before... Do you remember where you were at? Yeah. Do you remember what God did for you? Yeah. Do you remember laying your head down on that pillow maybe after that, after that morning service when you got saved? Or you could have got saved at a night service. Amen. You, got, you could have got saved in a closet. I don't know where you got saved at. Some of you could have got saved in a pastor's office. Amen. I don't know where you got saved at, but God does. But aren't you glad for the peace of God that comes when you get born again, when you lay your pillow on your pillow at night and there's just that sweet peace. Faith is the way of peace with God. And I want to tell you, I'm glad, thank God, I am justified just as if. What? I've never seen it. Amen. By faith. And that's how we get that. The claiming of peace. Notice, secondly, the character of peace with God. Notice this. Making peace with God is the most important relationship that we can have in this life. Men are constantly talking about making peace one with another. You know what? They, they go around and they make their peace agreements and their peace treaties all around the world. We're making agreements with Iran. Now, now I'm going to be honest with you. That's the dumbest thing yeah. in the world. Yeah. And I'm going to be honest with you. The, the government we have right now would make try to make a peace treaty with North Korea if they could. And they would give them all this stuff and they would welcome it in and they would blow us off the face of the earth if they could. I'm telling you, that's the greatest tragedy. It's a stupid... Excuse me, I'm trying not to say that word. It's the... Dumbest thing I ever yeah. seen, amen. It just is. It's just dumb. Making peace with somebody that's hostile. Yes, but sir. no peace comes because simply because they've not made peace with God. Right. I'm telling you, when you make peace with God, you can make peace with our repair. <laughs> amen. 
I'm telling you, glory to God, when Arvel Perry made peace with God, he could make peace with this preacher. Aren't you glad, glory to God, the peace of God that surpasses all our understanding. Amen. I'm glad, thank God, the character of peace. And it, it is with God. Not, not only that, but the third thing, the Christ of peace. Notice that. It is through Jesus Christ our Lord. Peace with God comes only through Jesus Christ. <coughs> You'll not have peace in just believing there's a God. You'll not have peace just coming to church. You'll not have peace just attending Sunday school and getting all your little Sunday school medals. Amen? When I was a boy, there was a man that sat on the, in, in, his, in a certain place in the choir. And he always set out from the rest of the choir. I didn't know what he was. I thought he was the commandant of the church. And he had a string of medals on him that hung from here all the way, I mean dangled down. And boy, he was proud of those medals. I thought he was a World War I hero or something. I really did. And uh, I remember that so very well. Uh, but come to find out, you know what? He was the wolf of the church, amen? Because he wanted everybody to know what he was. And uh, he, he, he was big on Sunday school, very little on preaching, yeah. amen? Uh, and boy, I'm telling you, that was a grievous thing. You'll not have peace with God uh, any other way than making peace through Jesus Christ. Right. Ephesians chapter 2, verse number 14 says, For He is our peace, who hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. In other words, we are on the outside of that holy place. We cannot access God because of that wall. Amen. I, I heard the reading of the Word of God today uh, on the radio as I was traveling. Love to hear the Word of God read, don't you? Amen. And, and BBN reads the Word of God. And they were talking about the veil being ripped from the top to the bottom. Yep. Ripped from the top to the bottom when Jesus died. It was a preacher on there preaching as well. But I like that. Amen. There was a partition that kept us outside from going into the place where God is. But now, thank God, that wall of partition has been broken down through Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. Glory. I'm glad I'm, I still got a little bit of Easter in me today. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> Not Easter, but the resurrection. Amen. Uh, I could, well, I hope that, I hope you don't put too much confidence in the Easter bunny. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Did I hurt some of your feelings? All right. No, don't get me started on that pagan stuff. We'll be here all night. Amen. But nevertheless, uh, I'm glad, thank God, for the resurrection of Christ. And then when we come to verse number 2 in Romans chapter 5, look in your Bible, we, we find that Paul begins actually to explain just a little bit about our access to God. Notice what he says there in verse number 2. He says these words, By whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherewith, wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. There is a privilege tonight of access. We have a great privilege. Did you know that? Yes, the Bible says, By whom also we have access by faith into this grace where we, wherein we stand. Salvation brings us the privilege of being accepted into God's presence by grace. And actually, the unmerited favor. Brother Arvel didn't deserve it. Neither did I. Neither did Boris. I hate to say it. And neither did Rodney Cannon. But we got it by grace and by grace alone. Somebody should run the aisle. Somebody should shout for the grace of God. It is a privilege tonight that we have because it is only through and by the good grace of God that we have that great privilege. I'm thankful for salvation tonight. And then not only the privilege of access, but how about pleasure? The pleasure in glory. He says, rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Could you imagine what it's going to be like one day? Oh, when the, we see the glorious God of glory and all the glory He's yeah. going to be, have bestowed upon Him. God bestows a great honor on us to allow us to come into His presence Amen. of His glory. And we should take great pleasure and rejoice in the fact that God would allow us to have such a privilege. Right. And I want to tell you tonight, we don't have to wait till we get to heaven Amen. to have a little touch yeah. of the glory of God. Amen. Amen. We could have it in Bible college tonight if you get right with God. Amen. Amen.
Amen, Brother James. I'm preaching good tonight. If we get right, could you imagine what would happen in this place if every one of us just said, Lord, I want you to have the glory and I want to get some of that. I want to see some glory tonight. And we just started doing this. Amen. Now, you know what? We could do this. We could. Well, two of you is doing it. But you know what? If we didn't do it for the right reason, you know what we're doing? We're just waving our hands. I mean, we could we could be doing Y-M-C-A. I mean, it's the same. I mean, hey, if you're just doing it for that reason, are you listening to me tonight? But it gets really good when we get to all just get to praising God, not because Brother Arville's doing it. Amen. One of the things that I remember most about my mother, Brother Tony, yes, and you know what? She couldn't see her hand in front of her face. She couldn't see your face in front of her face. She was completely blind for the last years of her life. And I thank God for that because through her blindness, God gave her a special ability. Yes. You know what? Church was her life. That's and right. she wasn't inhibited by anybody else's That's worship. Right. Yeah. I can remember. And I, sometimes I remember. Listen, she'd be the only hand that'd be up and it'd be like this right here. And she'd wave. She'd give that little old princess wave like that right there. I'll never forget that as long as I live. And it wasn't a way for me. It wasn't a way for you. It wasn't to impress anybody else. But it was to God Almighty. I'm telling you there's something about that. And I want to tell you tonight, God, He deserves our praise. I'm not talking about something we're doing. Amen. And, and I love to sing Amazing Grace. And I love to sing the praise God, praise God. But I'm going to tell you, there's a lot of people that raise their hand and sing that. That don't mean a bit more of that. Yeah, there's nothing yeah, to yeah, them. God. It's just an action. But boy, when God's people get to the place yeah. where they say, Oh, I just got to praise Him. Yeah. I just got to lift my hands yeah. and say glory to the Lamb of God. Don't you think it honors the God of heaven? Yeah. Enough to where He said, Let me just pour a little glory out. Yeah. And all of a sudden that glory just fall in the hatch yeah. and it get foggy in the place. Right. I'm telling you tonight, there's something about yeah. that tonight, this yeah. evening. It's, yeah. Amen. Yeah. Boy, it's a privilege of that. There's pleasure in that glory. Yeah. And in verse number 3 and 4, i got to move on tonight. I'm running too many rabbits, Miss Courtney. Amen. Yeah. Uh, in verse 3 and 4, notice what the Paul says. He teaches us, tells us that we can also rejoice in glory in the time of troubles. Right. Notice what he says in verse 3 and 4. And not so, and, and not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation work of patience, and patience experience, and experience hope. Listen to me tonight. Here we see the perspective of troubles, but we glory in tribulations also. Can I tell you tonight, you may not have ever had a tribulation in your life yet, but I guarantee you're going to have one sometime or another. There there's going to be a day that, that your world is going to like, you're going to feel like it's falling apart. And there's going to come a time in each one of our lives that we're going to be faced with uncertain circumstances. And I'm going to tell you tonight, there's a time that when we need to glory in that tribulation anyway. Right. That's right. And I tell you tonight, I'm talking about one of your pastors tonight. And I'm just going to, I'm just going to go ahead and tell the story. A uh, very dear friend of mine, his wife was expecting a, a little girl. And uh, I was over to the hospital at surgery that night, that day. And uh, I saw her walk by uh, the surgical waiting room. And, and uh, I, 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 she stopped and I went out. And she said to me, she looked at me with tears in her eyes. She said, we can't find the heartbeat. And uh, this was a full-term baby. They were going to take the baby the next week. And this was like on Thursday or Friday. And they were going to take it on Tuesday, and it was supposed to be a C-section to be born. And uh, so they couldn't find a heartbeat. So I went down with her, and the pastor was on his way. He hadn't even got there yet. And, uh, and so it, it escalated from there all the way through, and uh, the umbilical cord, they think, got wrapped around that little child, mm -hmm. and uh, she was born dead. Mm -hmm. And I was with them from that moment on, and... And we went in the room. My wife came, and she and I, and, and we sat there, and we watched that mom and dad and as they, they held that baby, Brother Kent. And uh, I'll never forget that as long as I live. And the longer we were there, the darker that little baby girl became. She was beautiful. She looked just like her mama. Beautiful little girl. And I remember looking over, and 
seeing my friend, the pastor, and I, I didn't know what to say. And he looked at me and he said these words. He said, Preacher, you just go tell him that God's grace is sufficient and that God's still good. I'm telling you, there's grace in the time of trouble. There's a God on the throne even when we go through tribulations. Brother Tony, you know about that. I could say, come and testify. And you could tell us about things in your life that you've been through. And all of us have a testimony, don't we? But tonight, I want to tell you, there's a God that will be with us and we can glory through those tribulations even at that. The redeemed are given insight here as to why God allows trials to come into our lives. Trials are not given to destroy us. Trials are actually given to develop us. Right. Mold us and shape us into that which God could use and get the honor and the glory for. I don't know what it is and why it is that God allows certain things to happen, but I do know that God has a reason for trials. Look in verse number 5. And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. Here we see the prospects for the future. And hope maketh not ashamed. The unsaved world has no true hope within. You know what this world needs tonight? This world needs Jesus. But see, there's no hope apart from Him. And this crazy world, no wonder it's such a, 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 a crazy place and, and so uh, unsteady. It's because that they don't know Jesus. Hope here means a confident expectation in God. That's question number five. Our hope rests in God tonight. And we can be confident that we can anticipate that the grace of God will help us to stand in the times of trials and that the glory of God might be revealed in us. I'm glad for the glory of God. Now, we've looked at the immediate outcome in verses 1 through 5. Let's look at the insured outcome in verses 6 through 11. And I've got uh, 26 minutes to get that done in. So we're going we're gonna to work through this. Amen? Y'all go with me and we'll get there. The insured outcome. God now tells us in His Word, He gives us assurance in our justification because in the following Scriptures, He has made justification possible. He teaches us that. Notice in verse 6 and 7, we see the crucifixion of Christ. It says this in verse 6, For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. I could stop right there and mark the word ungodly out and put my name. <laughs> and you probably could do the same. Well, yeah. oh, I'm glad tonight. Amen. Thank God He saves old sinners. Yeah. And I want to tell you tonight, and I want to report to you how good He saves them. Yes. How completely He saves them. Yes. He's even in the business of saving Muslims. Yes. If there was one in the house, I wish He'd raise His hand. A former one tonight. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> well, you can't see Him, but you hear Him laugh. Yeah. Thank God, Brother James, I'm glad that He's in that business of converting yes. sinners yes. who are lost in religion. Yeah. God can do that. And clean them up and call them to the gospel ministry. And use them in a mighty way. Amen. Yeah. Boy, it's amazing to me what God can do. For when we were yet without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure, for a good man some would even dare to die. We see the when of the crucifixion. Notice... When we were yet without strength, right. we were powerless to do anything right. to save ourselves. Yeah. We had no power to save ourselves. Do you remember the Lord saving you? Yeah. Was it anything that you did and no. said, Lord, I've got this power vested in me? I love to say that word when I marry couples. Now by the power vested in me, <laughs> by the great state. I love saying that, but do you know actually there's no power in me? Right. Hey man, I'm as weak. Yes. as a worn out cucumber. I mean, I'm just <laughs> wrinkled cucumber. I mean, just just weak. Weak, brother. I was <laughs> <laughs> weak. There's no power in me. 
And there's no power in you. That's right. The power of salvation has nothing to do yeah, with that's us. That's right. But it is something that is given to us. It is something that God does for us. Aren't you glad that we, yet we were powerless to do anything to save ourselves and to be justified in God's sight? But God had a plan that He and He only could accomplish for our salvation. You see, it's His power. Yeah. It's His power. God intervened just at the right time to allow us to be saved and have access to Him in the death of His only begotten Son. For you see, my friends, you and I have to die. We have to be in Christ. And He died for us. Ephesians chapter number 2 and verse number 4 says, But God... Boy, what a heavenly conjunction, the word yeah. God. But God, who is rich in mercy for His great love, wherewith He loved us, even when we were dead in trespass, in dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, for by grace are you saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. You say, wait a minute, preacher, I'm not si I, I've not been anywhere seated in Christ. Can I tell you, you already are. It's as already, you are already there. John saw you. John saw you. We done been through Revelation. John saw you. Amen. He saw those numbers that couldn't be numbered of all nations, all kindreds. What were they doing? They were praising the Lord. I'm glad, thank God, I believe we'll be a part of that crowd. Amen has raised us up together. Verse number 7, that in the ages to come and He might show the exceeding riches of His grace and His kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. I don't know what all God's got in store for us for eternity. Amen. But I guarantee you it would be more than just playing checkers. That would be pretty boring, wouldn't it? Amen. I don't know what it's going to be like, but it's going to be wonderful. Amen. And we can trust Him. We see the who of the crucifixion. Notice, Christ died for the ungodly. It almost rhymes with Rodney. Mm. Ungodly. <laughs> I'm getting some thoughts right there, brother. <laughs> Not only did he die for the Rodneys, but he died for all of us. Right. Christ did not die for the deserving, but rather for the undeserving. Right. If I got what I deserved, tonight I'd be in hell. Amen. Right. Oh, aren't you glad? The Bible says, For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. Notice what verse number 8 says. We see the compassion of God. But God commended His love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Yeah. Boy, if there's one verse in the Bible you need to get, it's that yes. verse. Right. Boy, that's a great verse, isn't it? Amen. Boy, think about God and His compassion as He commendeth His love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. As we look at this great verse in the Bible, and again, I believe it's one of the greatest verses in all the book of Romans, is Romans chapter 5 and verse 8. And when you lead somebody to the Lord, yeah. amen. Amen. Right. say amen right now. Right. When you lead somebody to the Lord, you need to share that verse. Amen. Right. That's a good Bible verse to share with somebody who is under conviction and you're trying to win to the Lord. Romans 5, 8. How many of you know it by heart? Amen. Amen. you got a week to learn it if you don't. Bless the Lord. Amen. You need to put that in your heart. As we look at this great verse in the Bible, we see three things about God's love for the sinner. First of all, we see the sacrifice of God's love. Christ died for us. Did you know it should have been you and I on that cross? Sure. He took our place. His sacrifice should have been me paying my price. But yet He said, Father, I'll go. <laughs> he took our place. The sacrifice of God's love. Secondly, the sanctify, saint, sanctifying of God's love. Notice this. He died. He died. God's holiness demanded a payment for sin. And then thirdly, notice the salvation of God's love for us. I'm so glad that God saves old sinners, aren't you? Amen. He died for us. Notice the cleansing by the blood in verse number 9. Much more then being now justified. What does that mean? Justified. Never sinned. Justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. Can I tell you? If you're lost tonight, the wrath of God abides yes, upon you right now. Yep. The wrath of God is on you right now. But if you're saved tonight, guess what? Yep. 
the wrath of God is not abiding upon Amen. you. The Bible says clearly that if you're saved by the blood, you're saved from wrath through Jesus Christ. Why is that? There's got to be a payment for your sins. There's got to be a price paid for the transgressions that you and I, we've broken God's law. We, we, we've, we've went our own way. There's got to be a payment. There's got to be restitution. Can I tell you it was paid for you and me on Calvary when Jesus was nailed to that cross and He was lifted up between heaven and earth. I kind of feel preachy. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Oh yes. Stop out another mm. yeah. Justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. Amen. Yeah. Justification or salvation is inseparably related to the shedding of blood. You can't separate it. It's got to be there. <coughs> Hebrews 9.22 tells us this. And almost all things are by the law purged blood. with blood. And without shedding of blood is no remission. The word purged in that verse means cleansed. It means purified. So, almost all things by the law are cleansed with blood. Understand that. Boy, we had some blood on the cross, didn't we? Sure. Have you ever, have you ever bled? You ever cut yourself? Huh. I was standing up at the, uh, at the altar of the church. And uh, if, if you would come here, Brother Arvin, I want to show you. The rest of them won't believe you. And, and we were putting up mission flags. And we were putting up mission flags. And one of my deacons said, I ain't got a knife. And I said, well, I've always got a knife. And I reached into my pocket. And I don't have a knife. <laughs> <laughs> and I opened my knife. Well, it was a second-hand knife that my Sunday school t uh, superintendent had given me. He'd bought it, and he forgot to take the label off of it. He got it at the second-hand store. I know he did. I'm just kidding. It was a nice case knife, kind of like this one. That's an Uncle Henry knife. That's a nice one. And what I did, I opened that thing up. And uh, when I did, I was demonstrating uh, something to the deacon. And the next thing I know, the knife was stopped in my hand. And see, I got a vein right there, brother. It runs out my thumb. You can see that indention in my vein. Do you see that little mark right there, that scar? That, that, that knife blade went right down into that vein. And every time my heart would beat, blood was squirting up like this. And it was right in the altar of the church. I mean, I was putting blood on the altar, brother. I'm just telling you. And, and my blood was red. Thank you, brother uh, did I have a scar right there, brother? You did. Okay, thank you. I'm just proving what I'm saying. And, uh, because you can't... You get, I could get that deacon to come in or not, but you can't believe the deacons what they say. But uh, nevertheless, I was bleeding on the altar. But you know what? My blood, I didn't, I didn't bleed out because I'm still here. That's right. But I want to tell you, on the cross of Calvary, on the Man. altar of the cross... Jesus Christ shed His blood. Yeah. The Bible says that that soldier, that centurion, took the, the spear and stuck it up and, and, to his, and out come blood. And that's a sign that He had bled out. He had bled it all. He gave it all. And you see, the thing of it is, He gave it all for you and me. And His blood is a little bit different than my blood because in His blood was perfection. His blood is the Father's blood. And the thing of it is, it's a cleansing blood. It's a cleansing agent. And you and I are saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. And without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. And I'm glad, thank God tonight, that it's not by the blood of bulls and calves and turtle doves and all those things, but it is by the precious blood of Jesus Christ you and I are saved from our sins. From Genesis to the book of Revelation, we see the blood. You cannot deny it. A lot of churches want to take it out of their songbooks. I like songbooks that have it in it. Amen. It's right. I charge today uh, 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 25 more songbooks to the church. Hope we'll have the money to pay. <laughs> Thank you. Praise the Lord. Extra songbooks. Amen. Coming in. So somebody say glory right now. Thank you. <laughs> because we just don't have enough for everybody to have one. And so I thought, well probably need 25 more to go around and that would be good just for the choir 
But, uh, amen. And, 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 and in those songbooks, it has the blood. Amen. I wouldn't give you a plug nickel for a song book in a church that had the blood took it. I wouldn't give you a nickel for a Bible that had the yes, blood took it. Right. You say, preacher, it's a bloody religion. It sure is. Amen. It sure is. And thank God for the blood today. Amen. Thank Him for the blood. From Genesis to Revelation, we see the blood from the time of Genesis to the cross. The shedding of blood was for only for a covering. You might want to know that. But when Christ died on Calvary, thank God His blood washes away all our sins. Now, I got 14 minutes. And I got eight pages to go. Halfway through, somebody shout right there. The conciliation to God. Verse number 10. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son... Much more, I'd like to preach that. Yes, Much more being reconciled when we shall be saved by His life. Yes, Verse 11, And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom, by whom we have now received the atonement. atonement. Now, right. we see in these verses that we are reconciled to God by the death and resurrection of God's Son. Webster's 1828 gives the definition of reconciled. It means to be brought into friendship from a state of disagreement or enmity. Amen. You'll get that after a while. Because did you know at once one time, you, if, you, if you're here tonight, you were an enemy of God. Yes, but God through His Son has, has brought you from that state of being having intimate, intimate with God all the way to being a child of God. Yeah. Now that's something unusual. It? And it, it, it's, it's reconciliation. In other words, it's being brought back into a state of friendship or even a greater relationship is salvation. And we thank the Lord. Justification, salvation, and reconciliation is a result of Christ's life as well as His crucifixion. Mm -hmm. that's, first, that's question 12. He was raised for our justification. Who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification? Romans 4.25. He was raised for our eternal salvation. In Hebrews 7.25, the Bible says, Wherefore he is able also to save them to what? The uttermost. That come unto him, uh, to, unto God by him, seeing that he ever lived to make intercession for them. He was raised for our reconciliation. In 2 Corinthians 5, verse 18, All things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. Now, what is the word of reconciliation? Well, we find that in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1, 2, 3, and 4. And uh, write those references down. We're going to let you read them after a while because i got to hurry. Amen? But that's how we're saved. We're reconciled by faith in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Write down the reference, 1 Corinthians 15, uh, 1 through 4. I want you to read those. Verse number 10 of Romans 5 again says, For if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son, much more being reconciled we shall be saved by His life. Notice the thought, be saved by His life. Does not actually refer to His life here on earth, but it's actually talking about His continuing to live after Calvary. Yeah. Jesus didn't come to live here on earth continually. Are you listening? Amen. He's not coming to live continually on the earth. Even during the millennial. It's just for a limited time. Oh, He'll be here. Yep. And He's coming. And you can bank on it. But I'm telling you, there's coming a day this earth's going to burn with flame. Yeah, that's right. With a fervent heat, it's going to pass away. And the new heaven and the new earth is coming. But because of His continuing to live after Calvary, because of the resurrection. And by the way, had there been no resurrection, there would be no eternal life. That's why we can get happy on resurrection. It's because that He lives. Amen? And uh, this question uh, asked for... Ex I, you need, I need to... Did, did you get question 13 answered well enough? It says to explain it. Did you explain it, Brother Arnold? Not yet? Okay. All right. Well, you got it in your mind to explain it. If you ain't, it's on the answer sheet. Amen. Amen. Yeah. I know how you operate. Right. Yeah. 
Let me give you the rest of the message here in, in, in nine minutes. Can I do it, Brother Rodney? We got, we're halfway through. I'm going to canterize it. That's what I'm going to do. Verses 1 through 11, we see the outcome of justification. We see the immediate outcome. We see the insured outcome. And now in the second half of this great chapter, I'm going to deal with the contrast. Actually, Adam versus Christ. The key verse in this section is found in verse number 16. For the judgment was by one to con condemnation, but the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. Here we have the condemnation versus justification. Paul actually uses this as, as he teaches as a, a term called federal heads. Any of you know what a federal head is? Uh, let me explain that maybe just a little bit, that term. The term federal head actually speaks in, in, in the Bible terms, is what we're talking about, of Adam with all humanity and Christ's relationship with all the redeemed. In other words, as, as humanity's federal head, Adam brought us all under sin, in the misery and death, and, uh, but by his disobedience. But Jesus Christ, as the federal head, in obedience to his Father, earned for whosoever will eternal life by faith in his death, burial, and resurrection. So, uh, federal heads are an interesting term, but Paul is using them here, and he's using Adam uh, as, as a description, and he's using Christ, and in, in they're comparing these two. Now, first of all, notice in verse 12, we see the reign of sin and death. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so death passed upon all men, for that all have sin. Now let me just say, let, let's look at this just for a moment. The fall of man. Think about Adam as the federal head. As by one man, sin entered into the world. Interesting fall. Being the father of the human race, Adam, and his disobedience to God brought sin upon all mankind. So in Adam, we have sin and we die collectively. No man, Jew or Gentile, can have any claim of righteousness because God has concluded that all are under the penalty of sin. That's right. Now, a lot of people want to tell you that there were other people besides Adam. Don't buy into that. Amen. The Bible says there was one man and one woman. God created man and woman in His image and His right. likeness. And all of us are descendants of Adam and Eve. Yeah, right. You say, preacher, how could that be? Well, I'll give you a strong comparison. Come here, Brother James. He likes it because every, every time he's here, I call him up. <laughs> now, in this class, Brother James is the only black man. Mm -hmm. There's not a black lady here tonight. But you know what? We're very different in color. Comparative. Mm -hmm. Our skin pigmentation is different. But did you know, if we go back far enough, we're kinfolk. That's right. Amen. Amen. That's right. Amen. And if you go back far enough, you're kinfolk. That's right. By the way, let me just tell you, he's my brother. That's right. You are my brother too. Amen. Amen. I love you, brother. Amen. Appreciate you. Amen. But you know what? We're all the children of Adam and Eve. Amen. Every person. Yes, sir. And the thing of it is, we need to understand that. And a lot of people, they, they reject that idea, but it's true. But we're all, because of that, under the penalty of sin. Yes. The Bible says, Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Amen. We see the failure of man. It is important for us to note that through, though we all have sinned collectively in Adam, it does not mean that Adam was the only guilty person, which would exclude us, the guilt. But the Bible says that sin has been revealed. The Bible says, so death passed upon all men for that all have sinned. We have sinned collectively, but we've also sinned individually. Amen. If we were honest with ourselves, Amen. we'd have to admit that's the truth. But as the federal head, Adam, opened the door, if you will, to sin. Think about that. Wherever you will find sin, you will find death. That's a sobering thought. I'm glad I'm going to a place one of these days amen. where there'll be no more death. Amen. And where there's no death, amen, there'll be no sin.
whoop, I'm about to run. I don't know if you get a hold of that or not. I don't know if you like that or not, but I sure did. Wherever you find sin, you will find death. David said, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. David recognized his sin and his need of salvation. We see not only the failure of man, but notice the features of man. The Bible says in verse number 13, For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed where there is no law. Right. Understand that. And then we see the direct and indirect commands of God. Sin is the transgression against the direct command of God. Adam was given how many commandments? He was given, was it a hundred? hundred and one. No, you, you're good. hundred and what? One. Only one? Mm -hmm. What was Adam's command? Not eat. To not eat. What? Oh, not eat what? That tree and miss the garden. Just one tree. Mm -hmm. He wasn't even, if you'll notice, the Bible didn't say that he was forbid to eat of the fruit of the tree of life. Could have. Didn't need to, but he could have. But God said the knowledge of good and evil. Mm -hmm. One tree, mm -hmm. one specific tree that God said you're not to eat. And Adam disobeyed. A direct command. One, one, just, don't you think God could have excused that? No. Not in His holiness, no. And one sin is enough to condemn any man. One sin condemned Adam because he sinned. One thing he did, right. he ate. One sin. Now I think about me and how good I am. <laughs> and I start looking at those commandments and law, and I think, you know, I'm not so good after all. The Bible says we've all seen. Adam was given but one commandment. He willfully disobeyed God's direct command, and we have inherited our sin nature through Him. And you can read Genesis 2. Through Eve, or though Eve rather, was the first to partake of the fruit, she indirectly disobeyed the commandment of God. That commandment was given to Adam and he chose freely to disobey God's direct command. Now, look at verse 14. We're going to see death contrast, contrasted between the practice of sin and the sin nature. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. Men died spiritually and physically before the law. They were sinners by nature before they were sinners by practice. They were born sinners. My little granddaughter, she's a precious little thing. I can't imagine her sinning but she probably already has. Yeah. She probably woke up in the middle of the night one night and went, Wah! And my precious little daughter jumped up off the bed that much. And my sorry son-in-law was just laid there. <laughs> my daughter's heart was racing. There's something dramatically wrong. There's a rat or something in my daughter's baby bed. She jumps up and flips the light on. My little granddaughter's laying there and she's just smiling. <laughs> What'd she do, preacher? She lied. Yeah. It's in her nature. It's in her nature. Wow. Sweet as she is, she's born with a sinful nature. And we're born with that. Like it or not, we are. And we are born with that and before we have actually the practice of it. Um, so, they were sinners by nature before they were sinners by practice. And the keeping of the law will never be able to save any man because he's already condemned by his sinful nature. Okay? Hallelujah. It's 9 o'clock. Let me give you the answers to the rest of it. It will be done. Alright? The reign of grace and life. In verse 15, 16, and 17. Will you read those verses when you get home? but not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift of great, by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. That's a wonderful verse. And not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. For the judgment was 
by one to condemnation, but the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. Mm -hmm. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. Yeah. See, Paul gives us a picture here of each man as the federal head and what each has done for mankind. And there's a great contrast. Jesus is the last Adam. And if you were to read 1 Corinthians 15, 45, it talks about the first man Adam was a living soul and the last man Adam was a quickening spirit. Man is declared guilty in the first Adam. And Adam lived 130 years and begat a son in his own likeness and after his image, he called his name Seth. As you follow the genealogy of Adam and mankind, we find that we are born in the image of our father just as Seth was born in the image of Adam. He inherited that sin nature from his father. Man is declared justified and righteous in the second Adam, Jesus Christ. And because of Christ's obedience to God <clears throat> the Father and His direct command, Jesus transmitted grace and life upon His descendants who are us, who are the redeemed, through the new, new birth and they're receiving Christ as Savior. I'm glad of that, aren't you? And I want you to notice one more thing in verse 15, 18 and 19. The Bible says, Therefore, as by the offense of one judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so that by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. There's a term here that I want you to notice were made sinners in verse number 19. It actually comes from a Greek word, kath is tima, a legal term which means we were appointed or declared sinners because of our relationship to Adam. Mm -hmm. That's your last question. You know what? I'm glad, thank God, that Jesus paid it all. Right. I'm glad where the first Adam failed, the second Adam prevailed. May the Lord bless you tonight is our prayer. Thank you for being here. You'll be at liberty to go.